Hello, and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We are glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersections of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the future. For some, the topics covered may include triggering or emotional challenging topics. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us in this journey. Please note, your camera is off and your microphone is muted. The Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. The conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas within a week of this event. Here's a quick reminder of the Zoom controls. Take a moment to locate the chat, Q&A feature, closed captionings, and the leave button on the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we ask that you share your experience via social media. We will be using the hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Kristen Deal, the director of ODEI, our moderator for this session. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for this session. Before we begin our conversation, we would like to take a moment and remind us, to remind us that today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, where we as a global community remember and honor the memory of the six million Jews and millions of others who were systematically murdered in the Holocaust by Nazis and their collaborators. Annually, there are three major days commemorating the Holocaust. They include Kristallnacht, uh, November 9th and 10th, which commemorates the Night of Broken Glass program that initiated the increasingly violent Nazi domination. International Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 7, 27th, which is a UN designation and commemorates the liberation of Auschwitz, and April Day, Yom HaShoah, which commemorates the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion and liquidation. As we spend today in reflection, we think it is important to remind important to remind us that over the last years, we have witnessed a rise in anti-Semitism across the US and the world. According to the Anti-Defamation League's most recent audit of anti-Semitic incidents, more than 2,100 acts of assault, vandalism, and harassment were recorded in the US in 2019. This is an increase of 12% over the previous year. Addi additionally, Hillel, an international Jewish student organization reports the rise in anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses during the 2019-2020 academic year. These events do not stand apart from the acts of white supremacy, white terrorism, and white extremism we have witnessed over the last four years, culminating on January 6 in the January 6 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Our commitments to and actions of diversity, equity, and inclusion must continue to both remember and to pro proactively engage in the work of anti-discrimination, anti-racism, and our educational efforts toward the deconstruction of white supremacy and neo-Nazism. DU's Center for Judaic Studies hosts the annual Marcus Lecture on or around Kristallnacht. The lecture series was created in 2003 and is named in the memory of Fred Marcus, a Jewish educator and Holocaust survivor who served as a member of the Speakers Bureau of the Holocaust Awareness Institute for many years, educating students and members of churches and synagogues about the Holocaust. On or around April Day, CJS hosts programming or partners in programming with local communities. Additionally, CJS has been working alongside the Colorado Holocaust educators, a consortium of public school educators instrumental in the passing of Colorado state law mandating Holocaust education in all public schools. With the help and support of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Colorado 
Holocaust educators to support these statewide educational efforts. CJS is developing an educational website based on the experiences of Holocaust survivors who made their home in Colorado. If you are clear to be on campus, we ask that you visit and reflect on these and connected issues at the Holocaust Memorial Social Action Site. This is a space dedicated to inclusivity and diversity. The mission of the site is to honor and remember those who lost their lives in the Holocaust by dedicating ourselves to acts of learning, dialogue, and bridge building aimed at making the world a better place today and into the future. Lastly, we ask you to join us during week five of the Diversity Summit on February 17th, when we, be hosting, well, we will be hosting a panel to discuss the impacts of the COVID pandemic and continued racial injustice on minoritized religious groups here in the US. Dr. Sarah Pesson, philosopher or uh, professor of philosophy, and Chendu uh, Jaya Chandran, director of DU's Cultural Center, will be co hosting this session. On this day, we take time to reflect on DU's diversity efforts over the last 20 years. Let us also locate ourselves in the historical and contemporary work of remembrance, responsibility, and equity. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to quickly introduce our two panelists. So first is Dr. Jesus Trevino. He is the Senior Executive Officer with the Leadership and Diversity Consulting Group based in Tucson, Arizona, undertaking DEI and inclusive excellence work across the US. He is a former University of Arizona Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence and Senior Diversity Officer, Associate Vice President for Diversity and at the University of South Dakota, and Associate Provost for Multicultural Excellence and Clinical Associate Professor here at the University of Denver. Lamont Sellers has been appointed the Director of Intercultural Student Affairs at Appalachian State University. Previous, previously, he was the Associate Vice President for Diversity at the University of South Dakota, and Sellers hold, holds a bachelor's degree in secondary math education from Shaw University and a master's in higher education from the University of Denver. Uh, thank you both for being here. I'm excited to uh, join you in this conversation. Um, we're gonna just start um, by reflecting a little bit on the last 20 years. So uh, we are um, in the 20th anniversary year of the Diversity Summit. And so I've asked both, pa both panelists to spend some time reflecting on uh, their time at DU. So um, I will I will give the prompt and then Jesus is going to jump in first and and uh, discuss his time. So I've asked them to reflect on the first diversity summit, which was in 2001. What do you remember in terms of DU and its commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at that point in time? Was there something that necessitated the creation of the summit? Um, and really help us understand kind of what DU was like at that time, Jesus. You're on mute, Jesus. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Technology is great when it works. Uh, I was saying thank you so much, uh, Christian, for the for that introduction as well as for the opportunity to come in and say a few words about my experiences as well as recollections regarding the, the diversity summit. Uh, at DU. It's hard to believe that it's been uh, 20 years. In fact, when I got the email from Christian, uh, all of a sudden I felt very, very old. I can't believe how fast the time has actually uh, gone. Uh, but it's very, uh, I'm very glad to actually be back at DU, even if it's just through uh, uh, the computer. Um, and I, I uh, was telling Christian that I haven't been back to Denver uh, in 20 years, so I need to sometime soon uh, go back and say hello to all the, the people that I know uh, there. Uh, there are lots of friends and colleagues and uh, former staff members who are still at, uh, at DU um, and that uh, many of these individuals actually uh, were involved in the diversity work that uh, contributed to the original DU summit. So when I, when I speak, if I don't mention them, I don't mean to leave them out and I don't mean to imply that I did it all course, uh, to run a, a summit uh, takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of people and creativity. And I'm grateful for all the contributions that they actually uh, made. I'm coming to you from uh, Tucson, far east uh, Tucson, Arizona. I live out here with uh, my wife and a business partner. We moved out here from South Dakota, along with uh, three dogs, a cat, and four uh, miniature donkeys. 
And uh, I've learned a lot about uh, the world by living out here. Uh, you always have to be on your toes because you never know when you're gonna step on a rattlesnake as well as other kinds of, uh, other kinds of, kinds of animals. Uh, when I arrived at uh, DU about a month after I got there, uh, Chancellor Ritchie, who was the chancellor at the time, called the meeting of all, uh, of, of all the high ranking administrators to talk about the goals for the, for the university. And I remember being in the meeting and the vice chancellor for enrollment at the time uh, was speaking about the goals for enrollment. And somebody asked him the question, um, you know, what do you plan to do about the lack of diversity here at the, at the University of Denver? And his response was, I'm so glad you asked me that question because we just hired Jose and he pointed at me, right? He called me Jose instead of Jesus. Uh, and of course, you could, you could see the faces that uh, on the other side of the table, everybody uh, you know, was just uh, uh, embarrassed that that, that actually uh, happened. Um, and I picked my battle, so I let that go. That happens to me, you know, quite a bit. And uh, right after that, the another vice chancellor, I don't remember what area he, he, uh, uh, he represented, uh, he gets up, he was, he was standing, he was right behind me, he gets up and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says to me, now I know who I can call uh, for great Mexican food here in Denver, right? And of course, everybody was just aghast as, as, as a result of that particular comment. And I told myself, I can't let that one go, you know, which really was a microaggression. Both of them were microaggressions. We didn't use that language then, but now I know that those are actually microaggressions. And my response was, I interrupted him and I said, listen, uh, the name is Jesus, it's not Jose. It's spelled just like Jesus, but I'm, uh, I'm not the religious figure. Uh, my name actually has an accent over the U uh, that distinguishes from, uh, from the, the, the religious figure known as Jesus. But I know that some of you are gonna expect me to perform miracles around diversity, right? And of course that got a big uh, laugh from, uh, from everybody. Uh, but later, after the meeting, when I went to my office, I got a lot of phone calls and emails from people saying, wow, what a great response. Welcome to DU. What can I do to help you out? Uh, there's so, so many people that actually do that. So what I got from that uh, particular incident is two things. One is that uh, DU had issues, and I knew that I was hired to actually address uh, some of those issues. And then number two, uh, that there were a lot of great people at the university that wanted to make a difference around diversity, equity, and inclusion, but in many cases, they had not been invited uh, to do so. And I always assume that about any campus that I go to is that, um, that a lot of people wanna make a difference, and my job is to actually make sure that they're included so that we can do this work uh, you know, uh, uh, to, together. Um, so when I did arrive, were actually uh, impacting the context for, for diversity that I think uh, led to the, the DU summit. One was that the Higher Learning Accreditation uh, Commission had criticized the University of Denver for not doing enough to address issues of diversity. And one of the reasons that I was brought in was to actually begin to do diversity work to actually respond to the Higher Learning uh, uh, Commission. The second thing was decentralization. Everybody complained about how decentralized DU was and how the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Uh, people were doing things and you know uh, on their own, it seemed that way. Uh, and for me as a diversity officer, that was perfect because when you have that sort of quote unquote chaos, then you can actually come in and move agendas as quickly as possible because you can, uh, do work with anybody. You can actually build coalitions, relationships, and uh, nobody's going to stop you from doing that. So it's actually perfect in those uh, beginning uh, days. Um, and I remember meeting with the student government, representatives from the student government, and I don't remember the names of the students. And they actually told me that the diversity summit, uh, uh, that they had created it the year before I got there. Um, and I said to them, you know what, they were very proud. I think they had something like 30, 30 people that showed up for the diversity summit. I could be wrong, could have been 40, could have been a little bit more, but uh, I was used to big numbers because uh, at uh, Arizona State University, I ran a, a diversity conference and we had uh, over hundred people uh, attend. So I told the student, we can do better. How about if we partner up? 
uh, with them, and and we actually did. So the the uh, second annual conference is when I actually came in as a diversity officer, and with the staff and the the students actually helped to uh, uh, create that. And the event was actually designed to do two things. One is to build capacity with the community, to try to get ideas, to try to get models out there, to try to get the dialogue going. Uh, and the number two was to build community. And the way that we did that is we, we actually had, uh, or as an example is we had three sponsors that first uh, year that I was there. My office, the student government, and uh, one of the deans I believe threw in some money. And then we had 30 co-sponsors. These are all the units that actually didn't have enough of a budget to, to contribute any kind of money. And we said, we'll list you as a co-sponsor. All we ask is that you send people from your unit uh, to, the, uh, to the summit and then as well as publicize the, publicizing the, the event. Uh, so we got, so our numbers started to go up. And uh, I, it could be, I think that the first year we, we hit 100 or a little bit over 100 and it continued to, to grow. And I remember when I left, I believe it was about, um, I think they were getting numbers like 600 and 700 uh, for the, for the diversity, diversity Summit. Uh, and all along, we brought in all kinds of uh, folks uh, uh, that have talked about many different topics. Uh, eventually we got on the topic of inclusive excellence and started to do that work at the university. Uh, one of the things that I was committed to doing is to making sure that every year we recognize the students and the student government for as the founders of the of the summit, and uh, and we did that uh, you know for the longest years because really they were the, actually the inspiration for it. They started with 30, 30 folks attending and then it grew and developed and they made a tremendous contribution uh, to the to to the summit. Awesome, thanks, Jesus. Lamont, how about uh, your reflections back on, on that first summit or the second summit, so that 2001, um, and, and how did you kind of, where was your location in it? How did you understand DU's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at that point in time? So thank you so much for, um, uh, for inviting me to join you on this, uh, on this occasion. Um, like Jesus, I was like 20 years, oh my God. I, I was only five years old when I was there um, working on my master's degree. So um, I don't feel as old as Jesus does. <laughs> but um, <laughs> in thinking about the, uh, <laughs> the diversity summit and, um, and where we were as an institution then, when I came to uh, DU, I was uh, there in the higher education program um, and had gotten a assistantship in the Center for Multicultural Excellence and was reporting to Jesus at the time. And when he came, when I came, he told me about this, you know, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to help the students out with this diversity summit. I was like, okay. And, um, you know, he had, he had these grand visions for things. And I remember we, we were in the little building that, and I don't know what's there now, but it was a little building um, near the corner of University and Asbury. And on the opposite side of the building from where our offices were, there was a conference room. And Jesus had said, well, we're gonna use a campaign approach to um, the work that we do. And we set that up as our war room. Um, so just like a campaign, we, we would come there, we would meet, we were throwing ideas up on the walls, um, trying to see what would stick. We were trying to figure out who we needed to partner with. Um, and we had, I, there was a huge amount of energy by the time that I got there, um, around doing this work. And there was this excitement that was there. Um, and it, partially due to Jesus's, uh, Jesus's leadership and his excitement about the work. But I believe the, the institution was at a point of, um, it was at that tipping point that Malcolm Gladwell talks about. Where, um, where there had been things that had gone on in the past and, and really had not gotten to that point yet. But when Jesus and I got there and started working with various folks from around campus, it just, it, it went, it hit that tipping point and we really were able to see um, things moving much faster. Um, I remember, you know, we were looking at the budget and what we we're going to be able to do for um, the summit and we started talking about, well, we need to have registration. 
And we need to do it in a bigger way. We need to have a team of volunteers. And the level of things that we were talking about in the committee that we had mobilized to get the work done, um, it was exciting, it was challenging, we were working on each other's nerves, but we were still committed to getting this work done. Um, and I, I remember um, I was at Encore um, in Portland um, year before last and was walking through the uh, convention center and I was, um, Peggy McIntosh was coming towards me and my graduate assistant was with me and I stopped her and I said, oh, uh, I, I just, I haven't seen you in so long. And I introduced myself and she remembered me because we had her as the keynote speech. She was the opening keynote for the diversity summit. I forgot what year it was, but I had this grand idea because we were talking about unpacking privilege and she wrote the article, um, The Invisible Knapsack. So I told Jesus when we were sitting in one of the meetings, we need to have invisible knapsacks. He was like, how in the world are you gonna have invisible knapsacks? I said, you know the plastic <laughs> ones that they have now that you can see through? We gotta get some of those. He was like, okay. <laughs> so I ordered, the, I ordered a whole case of these things and inside of the front pocket of them, I put the various types of privilege and we had those sitting up on the stage all the way across the front of the stage. And when Peggy came, um, she, she walked out and she saw it and she was like, oh my God, those are invisible knapsacks. <laughs> and she was <laughs> excited about it. She actually ended up taking one with her um, but that she remembered after all these years later, she remembered and um, I had a chance to take pictures with her and all of that. But it was that kind of excitement that we enjoyed during that time. Now, yes, there were some struggles. There were some, you know, so that being that it was decentralized and all of that as, as higher education is, people are territorial with things. But, you know, we we were we we worked with what people came with um you know people at all at all, all different levels and all of that there were some deans and some um, other administrators that you know they were they were willing to contribute the money they weren't going to show up but they were we we would we met people where they were and push this thing as far as we could and as fast as we could um, because we knew this was important for the campus. The other thing that um, that I will mention um, in this part is that, um, you know, as we were getting going with the idea of inclusive excellence, it really was broadening people's minds as to how we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that also contributed to what we were able to accomplish in those early years. Thank you both. Um, there's a, <laughs> actually a lot for me to unpack. I joined, I came to DU in 2010. And so a little bit, a little bit past when, when you all were there. Um, but it, there's some of the same themes, right? We, we have, we still have these conversations um, around things like decentralization and siloing. Um, we have these conversations around what, you know, what are the goals of this and what are, uh, Lamont, to your point, what's the tipping point? Um, I have a series of questions, um, but I'm just going to remind everybody in the audience to go ahead and use that Q&A feature and um, drop in your questions and, and we'll attend to them as we go. One of the things that I think is, is really important, um, Jesus, and, and you brought it up, and I think Lamont, just in your, in your embodiment as a student, um, it matters, is that um, students were critical at the beginning of this. Um, students remain critical as we do this work. And in the last years, uh, students and student groups have been challenging challenging the institution um, to, to do more, to do better, to, to create a, a larger kind of depth of engagement with regard to DEI um, and to live into those values, right? So not just have a mission, mission, vision values, but to actually live into that value. Um, kind of thinking where you are now, um, how do you reflect on or think about uh, the location of students with regard to institutional change? And uh, I'll start with Lamont on that. Say the last part of that question one more time for me. 
Yeah. So how do you think about um, or understand the location of students when it comes to institutional change? Okay. Um, critical. They are critical to um, what we do. Higher education is one of the, or education in general is one of those few areas where um, the people that work in it continue to get older, but the, the people that we work with, the students stay the same age. So those same, those same 18 to 22 year olds, those traditional age um, undergraduate students are always 18 to 22 years old when they're coming to us. And in thinking about that, um, each, each class that comes in, comes in from a different positionality, a different place and time, um, and different things that, are, that they're up against at that point. Um, when Jesus and I got to um, DU, we were just on the heels of 9-11. So we're still, we were still dealing with, at that point, um, a lot of issues that came up with, um, the, particularly around um, Muslims and, um, and Arab, um, Arab nations and all of that kind of stuff that we were grappling with as a result of 9-11. Um, I also remember that at the time we had um, the university had gotten a gift from the Marsicos uh, for the Bridges to the Future project. And that was that those were some of the funds that we used in order to leverage um, inviting various people in. But it was students that were really the driving force and that we kept going back to um, to get our cues from because it doesn't make sense for us to create something that isn't relevant for them um, and just because we want to do it. So, you know, in order to get their buy-in, in order to get them invested in what was going on, we had to continue to go back to them. Um, but then we were also paying attention to what was going on in the times and making things relevant for, for them. Um, as we grew the summit, this also became an opportunity for their voices to be heard in a very different way. So we were encouraging students to submit program proposals, submit um, proposals for, um, for workshop sessions, and they answered the call and they were amazing. Um, to think about the sessions that they were that they were putting forward and that they were doing, um, educating us on the things that were relevant to them as well. So I, I go back to that word critical. They are critical to this entire thing. Hey, Seuss, how would you uh, how would you think about the same question? So in terms of what's the location of student and student voice with regard to institutional change? Well, uh... You know, students have always been at the forefront of institutional change with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion, probably other areas. Uh, but I know that with respect to these kind of issues, they've always been at the forefront of change. Uh, universities, unfortunately, uh, operate on what they call the crisis model, uh, not necessarily taking a proactive approach and saying, uh, let's look at it from the perspective of the students. Let's enter their worldview, and then let's go ahead and see what services uh, and what issue that they're dealing with so that we can address it. That doesn't happen. What happens is that you have a crisis. Somebody gets beaten up. Somebody gets hurt. There's an incident uh, of insensitivity. Uh, then the students step up, and they demand change, and then uh, administrators will actually react and will actually develop that. Uh, so what you have is the model of uh, the piecemeal model. You have an incident and all of a sudden you have a multicultural student center. You have another incident and all of a sudden you have a women's study center, right? So it's all piecemeal. But uh, as I, as I, the metaphor that I use is the metaphor of the dance. The ballroom doesn't change. Uh, the, the, the dance doesn't change actually. And that uh, the students are there to remind us that we can do better. And they make us feel uncomfortable as administrators, but that's okay. As long as they're not throwing chairs and spray painting and breaking windows, that's fine. We actually have to listen uh, to them because we, most of us, were once activists ourselves. So we remember that. It's just that um, we got into positions of responsibility. 
to work outside of the system. Now we work inside of the system to try to actually make change. And students uh, rightfully so remind us that uh, we need to be held accountable. And, and that's good. Uh, and that you can learn a lot from students also by listening to them. Over the years, man, I've learned a heck of a lot. It's not just about me uh, teaching them, but they actually have taught me a lot. So you have to respect that process. Uh, and the students are, are in the center of that. Um, you, you both have hinted around this, and, and um, I'm going to try and draw a finer point on it. One of the things I think a lot about is that, and, and I've, I've shared this in, in meetings, is that um, I don't think DU is necessarily different in this space, but DU didn't come to the location of, of needing to invest in, in efforts around DEI out of the goodness of its heart. Um, it did so because it was pushed, right? So Jesus, to your point around the crisis model, part of that was the um, the Higher Learning Commission a little bit later, that was because in 2004, we were named one of the least diverse college campuses by the Princeton Review. Um, and so we were, we, were, we were pushed to do something different about it. Um, if I were to think about that through a critical lens, right, critical race theory may say that that's interest convergence, right? It was um, in the interest of the institution to do something about this um, because there was possibly a revenue, right, a revenue generating um, concern. Um, I wonder how you both think about how do we take these things, right? Um, you both hinted, Lamont, you hinted that the, the CME was on the outskirts of campus. Um, Jesus, you talked about like the piecemeal approach. How do we take these things and move them to the center of the institution? How do we take um, the work of DEI and make it central to the institution rather than that crisis model or rather than um, just kind of that the the puzzle pieces on the outskirts of, of the system. Um, uh, Jesus, why don't you start? Okay. Um, you know, I think for me, the first thing that needs to happen uh, in order to achieve that is uh, awareness training with the higher ups, with the executive team. And I've only been at two universities after I left uh, the University of uh, Denver where I was actually uh, asked to do a presentation, a, an awareness uh, presentation to the president, as well as all the vice presidents uh, and, and so forth and so on. That rarely happens. It's usually awareness training for the masses, for students, for faculty, for staff, but uh, the, the executive team is actually left off, that, uh, off of the, that agenda. It is critical that they actually get some training because they're making the decisions. So you can imagine the, uh, the issues that uh, are, are generated as a result of uh, a president not understanding the lives and the experiences of women on campus. Um, and that, uh, that if, I, if women uh, come and approach me as the president and they say, we don't feel safe on this campus uh, and the president is not aware, they may think that it is safe. It is safe because I leave at uh, nine o'clock at night and there's pl plenty of lighting. Well, if I believe that, then I'm not gonna give you the money. I'm not gonna pass the policy. I'm not gonna think about the initiatives to try to fix that. So it's important to awaken everybody at the top as a beginning point. And then the second thing that I will say is that inclusive excellence, inclusive excellence is about getting everybody to actually make a contribution to uh, diversity. And it begins with the idea of think about it, because right now there are thousands and thousands and thousands of decisions that are made on a daily basis on a college campus where people are not thinking about it. So I always push the universities in my consulting to whenever you come up with a new initiative, a new policy or new procedure, ask the question, who did we leave out? And that uh, in some cases, you're gonna have to leave some people out because it's not appropriate. Uh, and in some cases, you're gonna have to leave everybody out, but that's okay. The question is that at a fundamental level is did you even think about it? Because right now we have lots of uh, things being done where people are actually not thinking about it. So. Awesome, thank you. Lamont? So um, one of the things I think really does um, drive this is leadership. Um, that people are looking to leaders to, to drive it. The, and I talk about it as, uh, um, as is coming in two directions. You have the top-down approaches, but then you have the grassroots. And hopefully 
those meet in the middle somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and I, I remembering back to um, those times, there was a um, board of trustees member, um, Clara Villarosa. Um, whenever she would come in town from New York, um, she would come to, she, she would make her way out of the meetings and all that kind of stuff that they had going on. She would make her way over to CME. And um, I remember my first time meeting her and she asked me point blank, so what are you going to do for our students of color? I, that's what I want to know. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So, you know, start talking to her through these things. But she was that voice at the board of trustees level that was continually pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, <clears throat> I think back to um, Bayonne Holmes. She was president of the African American Alumni Association at the time. And I remember her, she was the same way. She was constantly pushing and you could bring up any topic and she's going to ask, well, what does this mean for our students of color? And she was, and neither one of them, um, and all of those that were that were a part of the African American Alumni Association back then, those that were a part of um, some of the other affinity um, associations, really did push the university on what are you going to do? We had a because um, you know they had graduated from the institution decades before, but they were like, we had a crappy time here. I don't want to see this for this current generation. What are you going to do? And they kept pushing, um, pushing and pushing. And that's what I appreciated because um, as a graduate assistant coming in and then program coordinator and then assistant director and then associate director, um, having those voices made the difference for the work that we were able to do because there were some times where we had to go to them and, and, and leverage their voices in order to get some things done. Um, and it's that leadership that, that we continue to need. Um, we just had our, um, our MLK event um, last night for uh, App State and schools across North Carolina and had um, Michael Eric Dyson. And he talked about that leadership that's needed to continue to advance these, uh, these ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, to continue to have these voices represented. Um, you know, in higher education, we get caught up, well, we need to do a climate survey. And we did all that. We did the climate survey, um, created the questions and sent the thing out and get all the information back. We're analyzing the data. And then somebody says, well, we need more. We didn't, there's not enough. And we end up in this spiral of, we just need, we're, we're constantly getting more and more and more and more and not getting anything done. And someone has to step in and be able to say, okay, we, we got enough. Y'all can keep on collecting, but we're going to make some moves on some things. This needs to be a priority. And it really does, it, 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 ha it has to come from the top. Um, I'm struck by the convert, right? So we've we've oddly enough come at this conversation from two different spaces. So the role of students and then leadership and, um, and sometimes I think those um, those are where we we plant the conversation. Um, I I wonder though, thinking about um, thinking about that space, right? So we've kind of built this almost dichotomy between students and leadership. Um, how have you seen um, the role, if at all, right? So over over the same time, we've we've started to talk about chief diversity officers, both in institutions of higher education, but also in business. Um, how do you imagine the, the role of a chief diversity officer in a time like this, right? Where they have to manage those two spaces, right? They, they are um, critically engaged with our students, um, but they're also attempting to uh, navigate the space of leadership. What is the role, do you think, of the chief diversity officer? For us, it's a vice chancellor role, but like, how do you imagine that space in that balance? Lamont. So for me, it was, um, it's like playing, when, going back to when we were kids playing telephone. Um, you, you get a message from one person, you had to take it to the, the other person and then going back and forth, back and forth. Um, because a lot of it in, in the sense of when 
the CDO is talking to students, it's trying to help the students to make sense of the things that they are seeing, what's going on. And a lot of times it, it comes off from us as that we're trying to explain things away. We're trying to, um, we're just puppets for administration. And a lot of times we do feel that way. Um, after I um, stepped into the role after Jesus left um, USD, um, I, I definitely got that. Um, and then it's trying to help administration make sense of what it is the students are asking for and what they're demanding from us. And then trying to figure out, okay, how can I bring these two, these two sides closer together um, in order to continue to, to, make, to make moves in the institution? Um, so we're kind of, we kind of span the breach. We, we, we spanned, uh, span that, um, that chasm between the two, trying to bring those two, um, closer together. And sometimes, sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. Um, but that's the, that's the tension that's there for, for CDOs. Thanks, Lamont. Jesus, what are your thoughts there? You know, I, uh, one of my favorite uh, metaphors, uh, and maybe some of you have heard it before, so I apologize uh, to you for, for restating it, but one of my favorite metaphors that actually explains very quickly uh, inclusive excellence is the metaphor of a dance. Because inclusive excellence actually uh, distinguishes between diversity and inclusion. And the way the metaphor goes is this way that diversity is like being invited to a dance whereas inclusiveness is actually being asked to dance. Um, and if the dance is actually gonna be successful and it's gonna take place, the ballroom is gonna to have to be renovated and retrofitted very much uh, like what we're doing with disability, although we're not done, we gotta go beyond compliance, but you get the point. Uh, assistive uh, uh, learning devices as well as the ramps are examples of renovating the, the ballroom so that that uh, community feels uh, included. Well, we have to do the same thing for gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, and all the other dimensions of uh, diversity. And then the ballroom uh, instructors, the music that they've been playing and the moves that they've been teaching, those are good. But they're going to have to learn some new things, some new dance moves, and they're going to have to start playing some new music. Uh, and then I say also that it would be helpful uh, to bring in those uh, ballroom instructors that already bring those particular gifts, those particular gifts. In other words, diversifying the, the staff and the, and the faculty. And ultimately, I say that um, the ballroom managers and the owners, they're going to have to say that this is important and it will be done. That's the president and the chancellor and everybody on the top are going to say this is going to this is going to going to happen. As a diversity officer, uh, you know, when I have been on a camp, on a college campus, I've been in the business of renovating the ballroom, and that's a tall order. The first thing that you need is the president to come in and say, "I will protect your back." In fact, when I was at the University of Denver, that's the first time that I had a provost that actually had my back. And he, he basically told people, if you're not making people upset, you're not doing your job. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that I was going around calling everybody a racist. You don't get anything by, by, uh, by doing that because you're not going to build uh, relationships. But when times got hard, you know, and you actually had to uh, speak up and people got upset that he still had my back in order to actually move the, those agendas. And of course, all of this work is to make sure that the students don't have to to do any kind of protesting. Their job is to study. Their job is to socialize and to have a great experience, not to actually make changes. Uh, but if, the, if we don't do our work as diversity officers, then we don't get everybody else to do their work. Because if you have a model where your diversity officer is the only one doing diversity, that's a flawed model. I've been under that model. It doesn't work. Uh, so do you want to get everybody making a contribution to, to diversity so that the students are actually free to study, do research, and make, uh, make contributions? And, and the end result of, the, of being attentive to diversity and inclusion is actually equity, that if we have all the systems working together in order to be able to uh, change things for the better, then equity will actually be uh, achieved. A lot of work. Um, and as a diversity officer, I, I was always uh, what they call boots on the ground. You are doing everything. 
you, you actually have to know a little bit about everything. You have to know about anatomy. I had a professor one time ask me, what does diversity have to do with anatomy? Well, here I go. What do I know about anatomy other than the fact that I've got a big stomach because I, I gain weight, right? But I had to actually come up with an answer about how anatomy is tied to diversity, uh, as well as so many other things that I've actually had to learn. So you're everywhere uh, and you are uh, trying to make a difference and, and uh, you try to get that, that motion or that movement in order to inspire people to, uh, to, to make a difference. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, uh, provide a question from the Q and A. Um, so one of our participants says 20 years on, I'm wondering if you could share what in your mind has changed or what has stayed the same. Perhaps you could reflect on the question in three parts with regard to students, with regard to educators and administrators and with regard to educational systems. So if you could share what in your mind has changed or what has stayed the same. Hey, Suze, uh, how about I'll, we start with you? I'll, uh, okay, I'll, I'll respond to that. Well, um, obviously uh, there's a lot of things that actually have changed and then there's a lot of things that actually have stayed the same. Um, we basically work for uh, white universities. They're led by white individuals. Um, and as I said, many of those individuals difference. I remember at the DU, when the university went through budget cuts, I remember the provost coming in and saying, everybody's budget is gonna be cut, except the Center for Multicultural Excellence. We're gonna protect that budget. And wow, what a powerful message from this individual. Uh, to uh, send to the community that diversity is actually important enough that we're not gonna cut the, uh, the budget for the Center for Multicultural uh, Excellence. The last four years have been very, very damaging to students, staff and faculty under the Trump administration. Uh, we have a pandemic going on right now that's impacting access. Uh, community colleges have lost a lot of students of color as a result of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, There's been demographic shifts you know, lots of people bring come into the ballroom, um, and uh, the the uh, uh, and then the the universities not preparing to actually have invite them to dance. Uh, so the numbers are there, but you know they're, they're still not working. They're not changing in order for the dance to uh, take place. The other thing to uh, tie to the Trump administration is that conservative legislators, as well as conservative media, have actually started to work on higher education. Uh, I know I, I was impacted at the University of Arizona by that. I had to go meet with conservative legislators who read an article in Breitbart about me that was actually distorted um, and they wanted my head, right? Well, this happened uh, across the, the US where uh, chief diversity officers have actually been fired as a result of uh, that. And of course, Black Lives Matter, uh, that those actually have spilled onto our campus. And, uh, and sometimes the campuses take, take the lead and then other times the community takes the lead. So there's a lot of things that have been, uh, that have changed. Um, so uh, doing the DEI work has become a lot harder. We're still doing it. There's a lot of people that are doing it in there in every day. Sometimes it's very small, sometimes it's large. You know, we're still moving, uh, but all of those changes have actually impacted uh, the way that we do work. On the positive side, we have, uh, faculty uh, from marginalized communities that have come in and they have done research uh, on DEI, and that research is imparted to students as well as uh, you know many of us, and we're able to actually have a better voice uh, for change uh, in in higher education. So those things have actually changed for the for the, for the better. Thanks, Jesus. What about for you, Lamont? What has what has changed and what has stayed the same? I, I'm, I'm with Jesus. There, there are things that have changed. There are things that have stayed the same. And, um, you know, I've been sitting here grappling with um, really how to re how to respond to it. Um, because in a sense, so I'll, I'll go back to um, the 2020. We had the death of George Floyd. And then everybody on the face of the earth seemed like came out with statements 
um, across higher education. I have never seen so many presidents and chancellors um, come out with statements on Black Lives Matter and about what was going on in society and all of this. And I kept wondering, why is it now, all of a sudden, this moment, everybody is okay with making a statement because many leaders, many of these executive leaders were afraid to make statements like this prior to the death of George Floyd, prior to the murder of George Floyd, um, because they feared that they were going to lose funding, that they were going to lose donors, that, that you know, any number of things, and they would, they, you know, wouldn't make these statements. So they um, oftentimes used the CDO if they had one to put out statements like this. Um, but all of a sudden you see all of these statements coming out and it's almost that herd mentality. Well, everybody else is doing it, we gotta do it too. Um, the thing that I, that I haven't seen change though is the response after that. Um, I, I was reading um, with a group here on campus um, um, how to be an anti-racist. And one of the things that, um, that came up as we were talking through it, um, are we talking about a moment or are we talking about a movement? And in the midst of it, we thought we were talking about a movement oh my goodness, you know, all these people have so much to say and, you know, people are jumping on the bandwagon. We're really going to be able to get some things done. I haven't seen much movement since then. Truth be told. So we're still, so we, we get lulled into this sense of complacency and it's almost like we turn with the news cycles. And just because it's no longer in the news, well, we got to move on to the next thing. We, we're worried about enrollment. We got to get enrollment numbers up. We got we, we to gotta worry about, um, we got new strains of COVID coming, but still we're dealing with the exact same things we were dealing with before the statements. Now here we are months later after those. Um, that's one of the things that I see. And when we start talking about, um, you know, our students, our students, they, they're calling BS on this. Our students are really calling BS. You all said all this, but there's nothing happening. Um, and that forces us as administrators, educators um, to try to respond, but we're coming up short. Last thing I'll say is um, I was struck by, I have been, every year I go back and read through um, Dr. King's um, speeches and books and things. And um, one of the things that, that struck me this year that I came, that came back around for me is um, that we cannot continue to uh, succumb to this incrementalist approach to getting things done, we we've been true. We we've been placating and satisfying ourselves with you know just this little bit, just this little bit, just this little bit. It's going to take seismic shifts um, for us to really see things change, and we have to. That's what is that? That's what I believe it's going to take, um, and we haven't seen that yet. I, I appreciate both of your thoughts there, and I, I, um, I'm going to sit with that. I, incrementalism, right, especially coming out of many of the critical theories, is is seen as, uh, depending on where you land, either um, progressivism and or the easiest way to stop progressivism, um, because it's a way to change the conversation to say, see, things are happening, but the speed at which they're happening is not not quick enough. It's not fast enough. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we sat with as our, our steering committee um, for the summit this year, um, 20 years, right? So what has changed at DU and what hasn't changed? What is somewhat similar um, or, you know, what is uh, the same thing, but in a different set of clothes? Um, and so one of the things that, that came up in the steering committee was the desire to change the name. So after 20 years, um, have we moved beyond diversity as a as a goal? Is there something that we should be reaching for beyond that? Um, um, because diversity is more often linked to compositional numbers, right? So who's on campus, who's not on campus. Um, and so one of the things we're going to be doing during 
the summit is we're going to be hosting two sessions, the first one next week, um, the, the second one a little later on, um, that are going to be open sessions for, for community members to come join us and help us think about what is the new name? What, how do we re-envision the summit 20 years in um, toward a new set of goals or a new mission? Um, Jesus, you, you mentioned that the first goals or the first mission were capacity building and, and building community. And I would say that those still exist here. We are still working on that. But are there, in this location of DEI, at this point in time, are there other things we should be considering? And so I, I'd love to hear your, both of your thoughts on uh, what advice would you give folks who are going to join us as we start to rethink the next 20 years of the summit? Uh, Lamont, let's start with you. Um, my name is spelled L-A-M-O-N-T-S-E-L-L-E-R-S, -E -L -L -E Summit. It, you can just go ahead and rename it that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I, I think in the next, um, for the next 20 years, um, we have some, we got, we have some serious issues to deal with um, in this country, particularly off of the backside of this, um, this past administration. Um, and, you know, I, I've been warning people, I've been telling folks that just because there are Democrats in power does not mean that things automatically shift and change overnight. It's not the case. Um, and the same type of, so I, I was watching a documentary not too long ago and they were talking about how um, white supremacy and um, these nationalists and all of them kind of went underground for a while. And then when um, they got the signal from Trump that they could come back out in 2016, all of a sudden they burst onto the scene. Um, we're, we're not hearing so much about them in the news right now, but my concern is that, that there are those that are regrouping their forces and there will be a backlash for what we have now with, uh, with the Democrats in power and undoing Trump's um, executive orders and all of that kind of stuff, having to grapple with that backlash. Um, so in the, ne the next 20 years, I think we need to continue to look at what, what the times are telling us and that we cannot get complacent just because it's not on the news doesn't mean it's not still relevant and that we don't have to keep pushing on these things. Um, that I, I think that's the, that's the biggest thing that comes to mind for me. Jesus, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Okay, uh, I thought about your question. Uh, and I think about two different dimensions that uh, your, uh, uh, your group should actually think about moving into the future. One of the dimensions is something that is a much more uh, positive, uh, future looking. And that has to do with some of the concepts that have actually emerged since uh, the first uh, DU summit 20 years ago. So for example, intersectionality that uh, that if I can understand that I am both the oppressed and the oppressor, uh, then I stand a chance of building coalitions with other folks. Uh, also, uh, that uh, I will be able to communicate with other folks without actually attacking people, because I will understand that the people that I'm talking about also have, uh, they may be in the majority they may be the oppressor group, but they also belong to oppressed categories so that we can actually talk to each other in a respectful uh, manner. The other thing is common experiences, that the idea of the Jewish community not telling people that they're Jewish students, not telling people that they're Jewish because they're afraid of discrimination is very similar to the LGBTIQ community that is actually hiding and they don't wanna come out because of the fear of, of discrimination is the same thing as the DACA students. They don't wanna tell you that they're DACA because of the, again, the fear of discrimination and on and on some of the learning disabilities. 
People don't want to tell you about that because of the fear. So if we can understand that we have common experiences. Then we, again, we stand the chance of actually putting our defenses down and getting down to the business of building relationships um, and building uh, coalitions in order to change some of these issues. Uh, practice and action, uh, the debt has to be hit hard. All the consciousness building in the world is not gonna help us unless we actually start doing something about this. Uh, and then of course, there's the systemic nature. The Black Lives Matter has actually made that uh, you know, part of the rally and cry. We need for you to take a look at systemic racism. Well, we need to take a look at systemic sexism and heterosexism uh, that is embedded in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the systems. Uh, and then to try to uh, teach students about, uh, as well as st staff and faculty, the concept of naming to be able to actually notice patterns that are happening and be able to name it in a public sort of way so that we can actually put it out there and deal with it. Um, because that uh, leads to the other dimension that you wanna be attentive to, it, to, to in terms of the, the, uh, the summit are what I call the ghost in the machine. And the ghost and the machine are the, uh, the invisible dynamics of diversity, equity, inclusion that exists in the system. Uh, DU is a system and it has a lot of subsystems, like for example, inequities, uh, implicit bias, microaggressions, power, resistance, privilege, whiteness, as well as uh, heterosexism and systemic oppression. These things that exist in the machine, um, but that, uh, that we, we need to really work on to actually get those out. So you have to actually balance those things uh, out because otherwise there's not gonna be any hope and we have to have some hope moving into the future. We have to actually think about creative solutions for uh, dealing with some of these issues that we've dealt with for the longest time. And, and you, have, you have to allow people to work in both areas as opposed to, no, we gotta tell you what the problems are and that's all we're gonna focus on. Well, let some people do that and let other people fo focus on solutions in order to move uh, on. Uh, you may wanna think about the model that, that, uh, that they have down in Austin, the West by Southwest uh, conference and festival. And they have um, you know, new music coming out, poetry. They have uh, you know, all kinds of intellectual uh, uh, discussions of, about diversity and other kinds of things. Uh, so think about that particular uh, model. Um, and then I, again, would encourage you to, to think about inclusive excellence because inclusive excellence is about, as I said, the ballroom, changing the system and addressing all the things that I actually that I talk, talked about before. <coughs> So we're going to have uh, one last question that that came in on the Q and A, and and um, I think it it branches off really well some of the things that that you just mentioned, Jesus. So um, one of the things that we grapple with, and I you know it's a pretty common saying here in higher ed, is that um, that what gets measured gets done, right? So that we're we're planting kind of at the center of of a conversation this um, evaluation and measurement. Um, and in, in that sense, diversity, uh, because it's really about counting heads, right? That's easy. That's an easy measurement. In some sense, that's the low hanging fruit. Um, but minoritized communities um, have known for a very long time that things aren't working in the system, right? To, to your point, Jesus, there's all the, invis the, the ghosts in the machine that uh, we don't do a good job at measuring whiteness, uh, fragility, um, all those types of things. So knowing that, you know, in higher ed, at least what measured gets done, um, how do you think about, or how have you thought about kind of collecting and submitting evidence um, of the dysfunc dysfunctional systems um, to make change, to make substantive change? Um, You're asking uh, how do you actually um, go about and capture some of the ghosts, mm -hmm. you know? Well, first of all, we all have to become professional ghostbusters. Just kidding. Um, we have to actually uh, make those invisible uh, dynamics uh, visible. And I think that the summit is in, in a, a perfect place to actually do that. 
is to uh, give it a name, the ghost in the machine. I just gave you a metaphor, right? Use that and then go about the business of what are these ghosts? And more importantly, how do they hurt people, right? And I think it's important to measure these things, but it's also important to uh, pay attention to the spiritual side of this work. And by the spiritual side of the work, I mean that uh, those times when people come and say, I didn't realize I was doing that, would you forgive me? I'm so sorry, right? And then the other person actually says, I forgive you for that, right? Uh, that's the spiritual side of the work as well as connection and community and that you want to actually be able to do both of those. Uh, most of the work that I do has very little to do with uh, data and statistics and those things which are very, very important. Most of the work that I do has to do with metaphors, has to do with storytelling, you know, has to do with problem solving, has to do with things that actually move the heart because you have to actually deal with both the the cognitive as well as the affect in order to be able to move these, these kinds of things. But you're right, part of the problem is we have to measure, we have to measure everything. How do I know it's happening? Well, you know, if you tell me that, uh, that you don't feel safe on campus as a, as a female, uh, what am I gonna do, go out and measure that? You know, I have to actually sit back and say, you know, there are things that happen to women on this campus that I'm not aware of. And it's very uncomfortable for me to actually realize that because I thought the world was this way and now I know it's not. So you have to have some, some faith uh, as to when people are telling you that this is happening, it probably is happening, right? And we don't need another survey to actually tell us that. So I'm not, I'm not fighting against the, the quantifying, quantifying of these things, right? All I'm saying is that you wanna actually work in both realms in order to make it happen. Lamont, you'll have the final word here. So um, my, my fear with trying to measure everything is that even when once we do come up with these measures, um, we end up in analysis paralysis, where we still can't get anything done because like I was saying before, um, you have those voices at the table that are going to say, well, we need more, we need more. Um, I, <laughs> one of the most contentious meetings that I've ever sat in on um, was we were talking about a climate survey and one of the, um, one of the, um, the deans of color, um, finally slammed his hand down on the, on the table and said, we don't need any more research. Um, we don't need any more data. I just told you what was going on. You have heard what other people have said and what's going on. What are you going to do about that? And, um, you know, it, it shocked everybody in the room, but it took that before people were like, oh, okay, yeah, we did hear it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm experiencing this right now where we keep asking people to relive their trauma in order to get more information. No, you already have that. They've written it out. It's been recorded. It's been posted online. It's some of everywhere, but because it's not in Qualtrics, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist. No, you've already heard that. And we need to stop re-traumatizing those people of color, women, the LGBT community, um, the Jewish students. All, we keep hearing the stories and we keep getting all of this but we are paralyzed and we feel as though we can't get anything done. And then the next thing is, well, we need to check with university council. <clears throat> so then we, we wanna throw the law at it and the law actually sets a very high bar for things. And it's a whole lot of crap that has to happen before you hit the level of the law doing anything about it. So we, we, have to, we have to get rid of this paralysis and, and just move. Um, you know, yes, we do have to higher, edu higher learning commission and SACS and all the others say, you gotta measure it. Yes, we have to measure some things, but we cannot get pa paralyzed in the analysis of these things. We still gotta get work done. 
Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I so appreciate the chance to, to speak with you both um, and to reflect both on, on the past, but also to imagine what the future could look like. Um, I'm gonna just take one moment to double click on something Lamont said right at the beginning, which was that um, students played a significant role at the beginning um, and created incredible programs um, to help both uh, engage their, their fellow students, but also staff and faculty. Um, this year, uh, we, are, we have an open uh, RFP um, that you can find on our Canvas site. Um, that is for student presentations and student workshops. Um, and those student workshops will be housed during week six and seven of the summit. And so our goal is to, to try and kind of collectively come around the conversation in weeks one through five, and then launch into those student presentations in weeks week six and seven. So um, if you're a student, uh, go to the Canvas site and find the RFP. If you're a faculty member, please push that to your students. If you're an administrator, find some way to get it to students. But um, we we want to restore that location of student voice in the summit um, that uh, that we've been kind of working toward over the many years. Um, so thank you both so much. Um, again, I, I appreciate your time here, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague uh, Clara to finish this out. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank our panelists one last time: Jesus Treveno and Lamont Sellers. A final reminder for those of you who joined us live today, you will receive an email with a link for a session evaluation. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Diversity Summit sessions. Um, thank you again for joining us, and we hope you will join us on our next panel, which will take place on Wednesday, January 28th from 1 to 2 p.m., titled Promoting Environmental Justice for BIPOC Communities. Thank you, everyone.